Dear Mr. Donfried, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very glad to be here and to present you some ideas on development policy and the context between security and development issues. As you might know, there is an ongoing debate in Germany on our role in international politics, on growing responsibility of Germans. And uh, this is um, certainly the right approach chosen by our federal president, Mr. Gauck, during the Munich Security Conference this year, when he addressed the German audience in saying that Germany would have to bear a stronger responsibility in international politics in general. What is still missing from my point of view is the aspect of development cooperation in this context of foreign and security policy. Because when it comes to debates in Germany on our role in international affairs, the contributions are mostly concentrated on military means, on deployment of troops or other contributions of our German Bundeswehr. Whereas the window of opportunity for stabilization by military means is usually very narrow, whereas security policy has a much broader approach, including especially development aspects. So the question is, are we really aware of for example, arising conflicts. The German Bundestag often decides on international missions and German contributions in international missions, such as a contribution of uh, 80 soldiers sent to the UN mission for the Central African Republic and South Sudan. The question, however, is what do we really do in order to prevent crisis, to prevent the escalation of fragile situations? Did we really notice what happens, what is happening now in Iraq? Do we really have a clear impression on the development in Nigeria, for example? What is going on in Kenya? What are the next fragile situations uh, with which we will be confronted. My experience is that we often have um, extensive reports on conflicts that already, that have already occurred, explaining why they occurred, but usually those reports are submitted after the escalation of conflicts, not before. So the prior question is, what can we do in order to prevent crisis and conflicts? And this is a prior task of development cooperation. Also, the post-conflict post situation is an issue for development experts. For example, in Afghanistan, after the withdrawal of the troops of the international community, the stabilization of the country, the development of Afghanistan will be a prior task of development experts. In the German government, our Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development will be in charge with Afghanistan after the withdrawal of our troops. And uh, when it comes, for example, to the growing um, irritations and um, fragility in Iraq, our aim, of course, is to prevent such an escalation in countries like Afghanistan. So the question is, what do we do in order not only to prevent conflicts, but also to stabilize a situation in a post-conflict situation in order to avoid future conflicts? This also is a question of development cooperation. So. I think the role of development cooperation is very clear in this context of foreign and security policy. 
from a point of view which um, has um, a basis in a, a broad um, um, term of security policy, development cooperation has to be an integral part of security policy, bearing in mind the situation before conflicts arise and bearing in mind the stabilization of countries in post-conflict situations. So security policy has is a preventive branch of security policy. And when experts in security policy uh, have a consensus that military means has, have, uh, must be ultima ratio, ultima ratio, the last means, then my answer to this perspective is that there must be some means before ultima ratio. And I come to the conclusion that this is uh, the core issue of development cooperation. So development cooperation is the means of first choice, is prima ratio in this context of a broad, um, broad wording and broad terms of security policy. <laughs> to underline this, I want to address the root causes of conflicts, which have to be taken into account and which this, this will not be possible alone by military means. It's also a question of development cooperation to seek for the root causes for conflicts. For example, the basic needs of the population like nutrition, water supply, healthcare, and basic education. So in a sense, you can say that in case of conflicts, the conflicts are always a consequence of bad governance. And the means, the civil means of development cooperation try to create good governance in order to prevent conflicts from arising. And also, with respect to post-conflict situations, the role of development cooperation is to stabilize countries in order to sustain peace and security. In the end, this is a relation of interdependence between military and civil means. Of course, you need a certain degree of stability in a country in order to implement civil means of development cooperation. But on the other hand, you also need to sustain peace and security by development cooperation in order to prevent a country from uh, from future crisis. So my, um, my appeal is to understand security policy in a broader sense, including the preventive and post-conflict aspects of development cooperation, aiming at sustainably, at the sustainable development and sustainability in countries in order to secure peace and security. So let me just outline some aspects of future linkages between security matters and development cooperation. First, peace and security should be a goal in the post-2015 agenda which uh, should be adopted by the UN General Assembly in September next year. The Open Working Group recently submitted its uh, draft paper for this post-2015 agenda two weeks ago. And our aim is to integrate peace and security as a goal in this post-2015 agenda, since security is a prerequisite for uh, for development and a goal of development cooperation. Second, our aim in development cooperation should be that a one world agenda is centered not on development countries or conflict affected states only, but on global public goods. This is also a question of discussion on from eye to eye level between North and South, South, Northern and Southern countries, between donor and recipient countries. So our aim is 
to create mutual accountability and to come to collective actions among all members of the international community. A third issue I want to present is we should implement development and sustainability issues in the Security Council of the United Nations more often and more visible, as it has been done, for example, with the resolution on violence, violence against women. But the Security Council should not be restricted to security matters only in a narrow sense, but should also include more and more sustainability aspects and that, of course, would comprise also means of development cooperation. Fourth, we should uh, establish a common analysis and an early warning system on rising conflicts and we should also ensure smooth transitions from military to civil means so we will have to uh, implement this comprehensive approach which is not only announced by the German government and implemented for example in common strategies on countries like Afghanistan but which is also a, a core issue of the European Commission and the European Union missions in many countries of the world especially in the African neighbor continent. And last but not least we should implement the post-2015 agenda also in the United Nations system. So my personal vision would be to develop the Security Council to a sort of sustainability council. So to make sure that security has also to comprise development issues in order to come to sustainable development uh, which ensures not only peace and security, but also the root causes uh, or, or enables countries to tackle the root causes of conflicts, especially the basic needs of the population I mentioned, from nutrition and water supply to basic health care and uh, primary education. So this also would be a major task of the United Nations to implement the post-2015 agenda, which uh, will be adopted by the General Assembly next year in its own structures of the United Nations organizations and system. We can't uh, see so far whether there will be a reform commission or any body uh, which will be charged uh, with this task, but I think we should take the opportunity of this development year 2015 of the adoption of a post-2015 agenda in the United Nations to draw the consequences, not only in the member states of the United Nations, but also uh, within the forum of the United Nations itself. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope I could give some ideas and incentives for discussion. I'm very happy to have a rather young audience and maybe some of you might become future diplomats or politicians. So my experience is uh, you always see twice in your life, so be polite to each other and I <laughs> thank for your attention and we can have a now a discussion with you. Thank you very much. Good morning, my name is Princess and um, I'm from Paris, and I'm a writer and a femi femi feminist activist. Actually, at the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women in March, at the United Nations in, at, um, in New York, we discussed um, the, about the post-15 MDG, the Millennium Development Goal, and some of the, the agenda, the discussion was about the education of women especially girls, because we discovered, we found out that when girls are empowered, they will be able to, they will be able to defend themselves in certain situations, such as uh, preventing uh, child brides and um, all forms of violence against women. But I discovered that there was a discussion, somebody said that actually that the, 
MDG post 15, that is it not just going to be something that will be only on paper and to not be executed at the end of the, at the end of the, the, the 2015? Now the question is, what are we actually doing about ensuring education for girls? Actually, when we're looking at Malela, the, the Pakistani girl, um, and then she came to, the, to Nigeria recently for, to dis discuss with the parents of the Shibok girl, the missing girl in Nigeria. And then she talked about ensuring the empowering ed girls as well, the same thing that we discussed at the United Nations in March. And uh, now the, my question actually is, because I'm mixing things up actually, is that what are we actually doing to em empower girls? Because the problem actually, when we're talking about violence against women, all forms of violence against women and even preventing MD, uh, FGM, uh, female genital mutilation, as well as preventing child brides and uh, rape of girls that is happening actually in India at the moment. What are we actually doing to empower girls? Because this MDG, this post 15 MDG is just there and nothing has been done. This is already, we're already in, Feb in, in July and if 2015 is just nearby. It, there's nothing, nothing has been done. I've, I've been, been looking at the, the United Nations website. I've been reading, I've been trying to do all sorts of research, but I've not seen anything being done. The only thing I noticed was the Microsoft. Microsoft is, there's a, there's a program that Microsoft is actually doing at the moment, empowering girls all over globally through, I mean, teaching them about computer, I mean, I would, I mean, how to operate computers, and that's just the only thing. But apart from that, nothing else has been done. And, and I don't know, maybe is this a collective, is this a, something that has to be a collective, or is it supposed to be a, in, from the national level, from different countries? Because we have the, we have the post 15 agenda, right? But it, the countries, each country, what are they doing? I mean, there's nothing, we have, we've not been hearing anything globally, and this is just something that we shouldn't have, you should, we shouldn't just have something on the paper, um, but nothing being, I mean, nothing being done. I mean, it's just that we were just, action is better than, than just saying it. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Should we take one or two others yep. together? And uh, I again would ask everyone, please, if you could try to keep your questions brief. That will allow as many voices as possible to be heard. Uh, but I think in the second row, if you could briefly introduce yourself. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for your fruitful uh, uh, talk. It was very inspiring. Uh, I was actually, what caught my attention at the very beginning is your uh, core mission, helping people help themselves. And I would like to focus on the role of Germany in the international affairs, uh, particularly in the developing cultures, uh, co countries. I'm from Morocco, and I have noticed that uh, Germany, um, over the past years, have or has uh, limited itself to a fellowship rather than leadership. Uh, and you've talked about that certain countries need to have uh, a certain level of security in order for uh, development cooperation projects to take place. Isn't it, this, isn't it time for Germany uh, to change uh, the policy into a, a leadership position uh, and start being the lead uh, rather than uh, following what uh, others do? Uh, isn't it time for Germany uh, uh, to implement more projects uh, and helping people in these developing country, uh, countries? Uh, or do you have other, let's say, um, constraints rather than security? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take a third question, if we can, or comments, and then if you could maybe respond, and then we'll take a second round. In the back, please. And as always, please uh, briefly introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Dumitru. I'm from Moldova. And uh, as you probably know, we have a frozen conflict in, tra in Transnetria. And um, I wanted to ask, <clears throat> When uh, our government approaching this problem, this issue of Transnistria, their philosophy now is the next one. Uh, we should develop our country, our economy, so that Moldova will be, um, will be more attractive for the citizens living on the, on the left side of the river. Uh, and in this way, probably they'll change the political, um, uh, the political arena in the Transnistria in a more friendly one for solving this conflict. Do you think this, this, uh, their manner of solving this problem is a correct one, is a, a functional one? Okay, thank you for these questions. First to education for, in particular, women and girls. Um, 
education in general is one of our major areas of development cooperation. Germany is in this context the biggest donor worldwide. We invest more than 400 million euros a year in education projects in our partner countries. And uh, I agree that the empowerment of girls and women is really crucial. And therefore, we aim to facilitate the access to schools, to education in general for women and girls. And this will also be addressed by the post-2015 agenda. It's at least part of the draft concept of this post-2015 agenda that has been adopted by the Open Working Group in uh, two weeks ago in New York. So this access to education should be uh, one of our uh, focal areas in education policy. Um, concerning Nigeria, you might know that uh, my minister, uh, Dr. Gerd Müller, has been to Nigeria a few weeks ago, and he also addressed this issue, and he visited a um, school with um, more than 1,500 1, Muslim girls, female students, and um, I think we also have to um, make clear in not only the international public, but also in the public of our cooperation partners, that education, especially for women and girls, is one of our um, major concerns and major interests, because in many of those countries, uh, the economic development as well depends on the engagement of women in especially in rural areas, many families, there wouldn't be a, um, uh, such a development without uh, the, uh, the um, engagement of women. And this needs, of course, education and needs jobs for a growing population. Um, when it comes to Morocco, you see Germany um, as more a followership than a leadership role. I wouldn't agree with this with respect to uh, our budget <laughs> and with respect to our uh, interaction, not only in the European Union, but also with uh, international partners like the World Bank Group or others. Um, our development cooperation has um, the specific advantage that we are not restricted to multilateral organizations or funds, but we also have a strong bilateral branch of development cooperation. Uh, that means that many of our projects are uh, programmed by ourselves and by our cooperation with our partner countries and implemented by own experts. So we have uh, deep uh, know-how of our development experts uh, that are active in the field, not only in capital cities, but also in rural areas where projects are implemented. And um, our budget is spent uh, to a bit more than a half on these bilateral projects with uh, cooperation uh, partners all over the world. And our strategy is, in a first step, to set some minimum criteria that have to be met by our partner countries, for example, with respect to the protection of human rights. In the second step, we are oriented always to the needs of our partner countries. And in the third step, I would say, we offer usually three fields of cooperation in which we think that we can offer um, comparative advantages from our German experiences with respect to uh, programs that are supported by other donor countries. So we do not everything. We are indeed concentrate, we in concentrate our programs on focal areas that on the one hand meet the needs of our partner countries, but on the other hand, ensure that we offer um, what we think is a 
comparative advantage of our German experiences, for example, in um, technical and vocational training and education, or with respect to energy supply, renewable energies, energy efficiency, and others. And to give you just an impression on um, our bilateral branch of development cooperation, um, when it comes to technical cooperation, our major implementation organization, GIZ, Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit, has uh, more than 16,500 employees all over the world, more than 2,000, for example, in Afghanistan alone to implement our projects. So I think this is uh, more a leadership role than a fellowship role. So I hope you, you can agree. Um, Moldo Moldovia, um, as you might know, my minister has also been in Moldovia in, uh, a few weeks ago. And um, he announced to strengthen our support for Moldova. I think this is a very important political signal in these times. And we are now working on identifying the specific needs of these countries, where, in which regions, with uh, which projects we can support the development of this country. And well, at this moment, I just can say we will do more and we are in good and intensive contacts from our minister, ministry with uh, the Moldovan government in order to widen our cooperation. Second round of questions. I see the first hand here in the middle. We'll take maybe another two or three. As always, if you could stand and briefly introduce yourself and keep your questions concise to allow as many people as possible. Hello, uh, my name is Ibrahim and I came from Norway. So I'm, maybe this question will be difficult for you, but uh, it's okay. Um, no, in NATO. We talk in NATO, security crisis in Europe now, Ukraine. So uh, no, we don't want, no, we don't need any NATO troops on the border with Russia, said Franz Timmermans, the Dutch foreign minister, in response to the Russian proposal. So my question is, uh, is NATO is NATO under uh, is NATO under prepared for current crisis to uh, attack Russia? May I answer this directly? No. <laughs> uh, there is a consensus among uh, the European governments within the European Union that this conflict has to be solved by diplomatic means and not by military means. This is very clear. I'm Ibrahim from Morocco. Uh, while you were talking about the United Nations uh, Security Council and how it needs to, uh, well, take on uh, other responsibilities like sustainability and development, uh, what's the official uh, German stand on the United Nations Security Council, especially when it comes to reforming it, and making it in terms of format, in composition, but also in terms of role uh, in the world? Thank you. One more in the front, no, sir. Yeah. Thank you very much. Dear State Secretary Thomas Silverhorn, my name is Gustavo Gutierrez. I am a Peruvian undergraduate student from Canada at the University of Toronto. Very simply, could you please tell us what kind of work you do on a daily basis? If possible, describe as something you could see in the picture so I could understand. Thank you. I know it's a very simple question. And then maybe there's another question here in the front, if we could pass the microphone, and then we'll welcome some responses. Um, hello. Hi, my name is Iman. I'm, uh, I just finished my uh, master in public policy, and uh, I have a question for you, Mr. Zerbehor. Um, well, I'm really interested in the future uh, Rule, which is, uh, well, let's say the behavior of Germany as a country 
I am really interested in the, um, how would you say, see the behavior of Germany in the future um, where regarding this uh, security and sustainability, taking in consideration that um, in the past Germany has, um, has played such a, let's say, a double-faced role. Um, for example, um, I know from a very reliable resource that uh, there has been a political decision to, con uh, to encourage uh, uh, big financial uh, concerns, uh, such as uh, Sparkasse, for example, to invest uh, heavily in uh, Waffen. Oh yeah. Waffen. Yeah. Uh, on the other side... Sparkasse. Yes, for example. And uh, on the other side, when, uh, in, on the, the Germany is not uh, is uh, um, how can I explain this? It's uh, the public image is we are not participating, but uh, the political decision for the financial concerns is invest. So um, and then after the conflict, we go and rebuild the country. So I um, I would really love to know. Uh, is there going to be a change in the future? Is my point clear here? Yeah. Thank you very much. So, I just want to begin with the last uh, question. What will be the behavior of Germany? We have um, intensive and uh, strong coordination when it comes to the export of weapons from our country to other countries. Germany has uh, the strongest regulations on those experts within the European Union. And we have a special committee in the cabinet, including the Minister for Development Cooperation, uh, which uh, decides on the export of weapons. And uh, therefore, I think we are on the right way. There is no double standard uh, politics. But of course, we have to bear in mind the situation in countries uh, in, in which um, either companies want to invest or to export weapons. And we also have to bear in mind that the situation in those countries might change over time. So I wouldn't exclude that there is room for optimizing our rules in this context, and I think we are in a very transparent and public debate on this issue. If you have a look in uh, to German newspapers uh, in these days, in recent weeks, you will see that this is an ongoing public uh, debate, and we also uh, there has also been uh, the question whether. Uh, the ministries um, um, included in this decision-making progress should be reorganized, uh, so the, the, the ministries which are in charge of those decisions. So there is a really fundamental uh, debate, and I think what is necessary is that we have a strategy which is embedded in a common European Union and NATO strategy in this context, and which is uh, suitable to uh, create and sustain confidence in what we are doing in this field. Um, the second question, what, uh, what uh, am I doing on a daily basis? <laughs> <laughs> oh, a simple question. And of course, it's uh, justified to, to ask what politicians are doing. Um, First, as Parliamentary State Secretary, my task is to organize the contact uh, between our ministry and the Parliament. This is the parliamentary branch of my work as Parliamentary State Secretary. So I am present not only in plenary debates in the German Bundestag, but also in commission meetings. Um, I. I am the one who signs the letters to deputies and many others. So we try to ensure that our minister can
concentrate himself on the most important things of the important things, and uh, which is not the most important of the important things is done by parliamentary state secretaries. Uh, second, uh, I'm engaged in uh, our multilateral aspects of development cooperation. As you already mentioned, Mr. Donfried, I'm uh, the German governor, for example, in the African Development Bank. Uh, I attended uh, the, the spring meeting of the World Bank. I'm attending many international conferences so that our ministry and our government is present and can participate in international discussions. This can not always be done by our minister himself, so we try to support his work and his political aims by, uh, well, attending those conferences and international uh, meetings and uh, also bilateral talks on these issues of, for example, the post-2015 agenda or regional development banks. And third, I am engaged in our bilateral development cooperation in many areas. Um, I concentrate uh, geographically on the African continent and on the Middle East and Near East region and um, on specific uh, sectoral issues like uh, education, health and others. And of course, I am not only um, in many countries uh, in the field or in, in talks, but also uh, have many um, dialogue partners here in Berlin, not only ambassadors, many ministers and others coming here um, are, uh, are my, my dialogue partners. Um, of course, you, you might imagine that uh, there are many cooperation countries uh, that benefit from our programs of development uh, cooperation, and this also is accompanied uh, by me and uh, uh, to some extent uh, uh, not only followed but uh, steered by uh, my engagement in the bilateral branch of development cooperation. So this, in a nutshell, what we are doing, parliamentary, bilaterally and multilaterally. Sorry, I, I, oh, the missed, sorry, I missed the, the answer uh, um, on, on, on the first question uh, on the reform of the United Nations uh, Security Council. Um, well, if you ask for an official statement of the German government, I would say we are engaged in an ongoing debate on reforming the United Nations system. And I tried to enrich this debate by some personal views and perspectives and ideas. And um, this is not in any contradiction to a government position. It's uh, one part of our um, process of uh, contributing to this international debate. And um, if you've um, experienced with the United Nations system, you might see that there is a certain, I wouldn't say um, a discrepancy, but you have experts on security policy in the United Nations and you have experts on development corporations. Uh, they are organized in different bodies of the organization, so it's always a question of coherence and coordination to put these two aspects together. And this is not only the case in the United Nations system, it's also an experience in the U European Union, for example, and it's an, uh, a lasting uh, task and debate also in, on a government level. So if we want to ensure this comprehensive approach, we must understand that coordination and coherence is um, is, an, is, is a lasting uh, task for all the um, organizations or for all the ministries um, engaged in this debate. Uh, we will always uh, have to secure 
comprehensiveness um, on a daily basis from country to country, from project to project, from mission to mission. And um, in this respect, I think we have to see that we can and should learn from each other, development experts from security experts and the other way around, because we should aim uh, commonly on sustainable development, ensuring both security and peace on the one side and a prosperous development on the other side. This has to be combined together and all the experts involved in this process have steadily to, to overcome the boundaries of their fields of engagement and to work together and coordinate their work. And for maybe one more question, I'm uh, looking at the clock, uh, maybe here in the front, or, yeah, or, or two questions if you both promise to be brief. <laughs> Ladies first, and then, okay. Hello, my name's Fiona, and I'm half British and half German, and my question for you is, um, what difficulties does your ministry face in um, development aid, and how much is corruption a problem in developing countries for you? Mm -hmm. Not for you personally, but for your ministry. The final question for Raj, I think over there. Um, hello, sir. My name is Rajat and I'm from the Hoti School of Governance. Uh, my question is specifically um, regarding um, you as a representing the BMZ. As we know, the BMZ along with the GIZ has been supporting um, the UNRWA schools in the Palestinian territories. And since three of those schools have been bombed and around seven German citizens have been killed along with 60 more German families that are at risk currently in Gaza, but surprisingly, the government, especially the BMZ, has been surprisingly silent on this matter. Since we are at a conference regarding cultural diplomacy, what do you think as a representative of the German government um, should happen? Basically, any opinion or a statement from your side on that? Yes, thank you. Um, the escalation in the conflict between Israel and the Palestinian areas is a very sev severe one. Um, of course, it is a, a, a severe issue that uh, projects or buildings that have been established uh, with our means uh, are destroyed during this conflict. So this is not the progress we want to see in development cooperation. But the most important thing that is needed now is to come to a ceasefire and to bring the conflicting parties back uh, to the table for negotiations, which is not the case so far. And what, what concerns me is that um, the number of countries, the number of uh, statesmen that are able to influence uh, the conflicting parties is uh, rather overseeable. You know the very clear comments from the side of the United States administration, for example. Germany is a member of the Near East Quartet, as you might know, and we are acting in close coordination with our Quartet partners. But uh, it's our concern that uh, our means of influencing the situations are restricted, obviously. And my personal <coughs> experience is to say it uh, very generally that uh, political will is the first which is needed to solve political crisis. And uh, this um, leads me to the first question, what are the difficulties in development cooperation? The biggest difficulty in development cooperation is the lack of political will. Um, I attended the annual meeting of the African Development Bank in April in Rwanda. 
and during this conference there was an um, opinion poll among the governors, which are mostly ministers, finance ministers from the African member countries of the African Development Bank. So a majority of African ministers um, in, uh, in the board of governors. And the question was, one of the questions was, what from the perspective of governors would be the major obstacle for successful development? And the answer by more than two thirds of the governors was the lack of political will. This shows on the one side that there is a high degree of self-awareness of the situation in the respective countries. But on the other side, it shows also what still has to be done. And um, the lack of political will stands, in other words, for a need for more good governance. Or as I said it before, the root causes of a conflict is always bad governance. So the development cooperation policy has to give an answer to the question what is needed to reach good governance. And from my point of view, I would say there are three major challenges we are facing in development cooperation and which are the major difficulties. First, the countries concerned need to meet the basic needs of their population. As I already mentioned, food security, nutrition, water supply, primary and secondary education, hopefully secondary, but at least primary education, and basic health care. Second, those countries need targeted investments in their infrastructure in order to enable a broader population to benefit from the uh, prosperity which is generated in the country and in order to overcome the gap of poverty and to reach a middle income level. And this does not only mean investments in transport systems, for example, but also in energy, so anything, anything of infrastructure which is uh, suitable to enable a broader population to benefit from this prosperity in a country. And third, what we need is uh, functioning administrations, independent judiciary, independent media, transparency, accountability, so everything what can be described, described as good governance. I think these are the three major issues we have to secure in countries to, to reach a sustainable and successful uh, development. And to an answer this question, you could also have a look at um, emerging countries and ask the question, what have been the reasons why those emerging countries have been successful or more successful than other countries in recent years? And I think the answer is quite this what I said. Uh, to meet the uh, 